appears anytime we have a Mohawk Valley topic or a speaker who's born and raised in Mohawk Valley, we sort of fill up this place and uh, just uh, nobody called the fire inspector. <laughs> uh, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Charles Gehring, but most many of you probably know Ms. Charlie. Uh, Gehring was born in, in Fort Plain, so uh, those he, he told me this before that he not only is, he was born right in Fort Plain in his grandmother's house, so he was actually born in Fort Plain. He graduated from VMI, majoring in German. Um, he spent uh, some time in Freiburg University in, in Germany. Um, he completed his doctoral work in German linguistics at Indiana University, where he specialized in Netherlandic studies. Um, he came to Albany in, in the 1960s to teach German at, at SUNY Albany um, and worked summers at uh, Fort Clock. Um, he did not get tenure at SUNY Albany, which was uh, SUNY's loss, but history's gain, I think. Um, he began working on the New Netherlands project in the State Library in 1974. Um, they, that that uh, that project was to translate the many uh, Dutch uh, colonial records that were housed in the uh, in the library and then later in the uh, in the state archives. Um, in 1978, the New Netherlands project received a grant from the National Endowment for Humanities and received a, a follow-up grant for, for many years after that. Um, he helped to found the New Netherlands Institute, and he is director of the New Netherlands Research Center which uh, is supported by the Institute in partnership with the New York State Office of Cultural Education uh, the, and the parent agency of the State Library and State Archives. Um, in 1994, uh, Her Majesty Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands conferred a Dutch knighthood in the Order of the Orange Nassau on the Fort Plain native Charles Gary. So it's, I don't know if he goes by Sir Charles, but that's a good one. Charlie, Charlie has worked on Dutch uh, Dutch records for, for almost 50 years. That's what I One year minus uh, uh, 50. One year minus 50. Yeah. Uh, Charlie's also a long term uh, resident of the town of New Scotland, proud resident of the town of New Scotland, and, uh, and an ISHA member. So please welcome Dr. Charles Gary. Thank you, Alan. Uh, is it coming through back there? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, first of all, what's that picture on the screen? Good question. <laughs> um, I wrote the title. The title, the caption got cut off for some reason, but it's over here, Colvin, Colvin with Ice. Which means golf on the ice. <laughs> Unplayed golf. And uh, in 1650, one of the scholars got arrested for uh, stabbing someone in the tavern uh, because the other party was um, back, backing out on a debt that they, or a, a, a bet that they had made. Uh, so we know that at least it goes back to 1650. There's a, there's a regulation in uh, the records that I translate. And, uh, in fact, they have a copy of it in the Port Orange Club, where in 1656 it was prohibited to play golf in the streets of Alban, or in the streets of Baverbank, because too many windows were getting broken, <laughs> and too many people were getting hurt. These balls that they hit were about that size, a little smaller than a softball. They were filled with horse hair and stitched together with copper, copper uh, thread. And so uh, they were formidable. The, the heads of the golf clubs were made out of lead, and I think people are finding these, and they don't know what they are. They're like a, they're like a a large iron uh, for a golf club, and it was attached to a wooden pole. If you ever find one in your backyard or digging around, uh, let me know. We we haven't found them uh, so far. Uh, 
There's not going to be any blood this month, gentlemen. <laughs> the last time you were here was the Battle of Oriskany, and there was a, a lot of trouble going on. And uh, this will be uh, quite different, I think. <coughs> how many of you are from this area? I should have said how many of you are not. <laughs> I, I figured that would be the case. Uh, and, uh, I, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, some details anyway, whether you like it or not. <laughs> uh, mainly background, I definitely want you to understand why the Dutch were here in the first place. There's one thing when I uh, give a talk like this, uh, I ask if anybody knows this word. Is there anybody here who knows Winkelhock? Does that ring a bell? Winkelhock. It's a it's a corner rip. Exactly. Yeah. A what? And I usually get one person. <laughs> and, uh, and it's usually a man, not a woman. <laughs> but uh, women, my mother used to have to uh, mend them. If you live in an area with a lot of barbed wire and you're a kid running around in the fields and going through uh, barbed wire fences, you get this, uh, you get a corner cut. Not always, but. Uh, yes. Yes. And that's a winkle hawk. <laughs> and it's it's the name for a carpenter square. The big metal carpenter square is a, a, a winkle hack in, in Dutch. So we have at least one person who has uh, remembered that. Uh, we still used it when I was growing up in the Mohawk Valley um, back, in the, back in the 50s. I was always getting we had a farm. I lived in Nelliston in a little village across the river from Fort Plain. And there was a farm actually right in the center of the village across the street from, uh, from us. And he had pastures and a lot of barbed wire. And uh, we were always out playing in his fields. There were a lot of Dutch in the Mohawk Valley as well as Palatine Germans. I come from the town of Palatine, so you, you know that this uh, is going to be a uh, uh, mostly German uh, area, but uh, if you go a little bit east down the river, you find a lot more uh, Dutch. In the Amsterdam area, Fonda, Fonda for example, is named after a, a Dutch uh, family. In fact, I was there when Jane Fonda came and gave her a Bible to a local uh, library in, uh, in Fonda that went back to the uh, Dutch period. I grew up with a lot of bands. Uh, there was a, a Van Skyk, or as we pronounced it, Van Skoink. That's the way it was pronounced in, in Nelson. It's pronounced in various ways. It's, uh, they were across the street from us, just down the street, uh, was a Van Alstein, the local tavern in this village of uh, 600 was a Van Fechten, and there were a lot of other uh, bands uh, that I couldn't come up with. Uh, is there a Van Alstein here? Do you know where that comes from? Um, I thought it was from King Gustav Waldenstein when he separated his land. From where? I thought it was from 936 when King Otto separated his land among his children and then named one Waldenstein. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good story. <laughs> But it comes from. <laughs> this is Holstein in Germany. Oh, And uh, I have a document where the name Van Alstein appears twice. Once with the H and once spelled with an A. And it's the same person. Well, the first time I came over to 
for that work from Ben Alstein would not have been Alstein. It was John Moore Tent. He came over in 1652. 1652, yeah. Uh, and so I don't know. Yeah, that would be later. This uh, the original Ben Alstein, okay. I think, came over. But all uh, of the Alstein work is on Red Source Bank. Uh, all yeah. of the Alstein are descended from John Moore Tent. We'll talk some more about this, but this <laughs> there were a group of islands here called uh, Ost of Island, and uh, there was a tsunami that wiped out one of these islands, uh, killed like ten thousand people, uh, killed all of the livestock, salted the ground for generations, and the people that managed to escape ended up over here. And then they migrated down and then eventually into the Netherlands. We have uh, five or six families, a couple of twins, in fact, who came from that area. So you like the Baltic Sea in Germany going up to Denmark, that area? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's a von Alstein graveyard across from my house on Meadowville Road. Yeah. yeah. It's, been, it's one of those names that people have been puzzled over because the age was dropped. And you, if you look up in a uh, uh, dictionary of place names and Dutch place names in the 17th century, you're not going to find an all stock. But you, uh, but you have to look for it's actually a Holstein, is what they're uh, writing. But that's one of the problems that you run into. Uh, genealogists from the uh, West who find out they have Dutch ancestors. They eventually get down to the 17th century and they hit a brick wall. They cannot have any relationship to their ancestors at that point because of the naming system. And we're going to talk about that uh, in a little while. The Dutch who were in, it's funny, when I was a kid, uh, we we had a uh, we had a lot of Germans, uh, Italians, a lot of refugees from uh, World War II, and uh, uh, I knew what their story was pretty much, but I didn't know what the band story was. Why did you have all of these Van Alsteins and uh, and Vestens uh, and so forth? And I remember somebody telling me. Oh, they've always been here. <laughs> they're, they're old Dutch, is the way they put it. And they've always been here. They came from the east, from down in Albany in that area. So I always had this uh, feeling about this mystical place, almost like Oz, down at the end of the Mohawk River. And uh, it was years before I actually got there to find out what it was all about. But it was, uh, they had a special, uh, uh, meaning to me for a long period of time. Now, why, why the Dutch? This is the size of the Netherlands. We all know New York pretty well. Uh, we know how long it takes to get from, let's say, Plattsburgh to Binghamton. That would be like going from uh, Groningen to Middleburg uh, in, in the Netherlands. This is uh, the present state of affairs in the Netherlands right now. It was a, a bit bigger. This is like seven provinces. There were 17 provinces altogether, and the 10 in the south stayed Catholic and stayed with Spain. The seven above. Uh, form their own uh, country, the United uh, Provinces. Now there's a story behind all of this. This is a young couple. He is uh, 20, he's 18 and she's 20 years old. He's just put a ring on her finger that has a diamond in it. Supposedly, this is the first diamond engagement ring ever recorded, in case you like those details like that. And you can actually see it if you get up close and put a magnifying glass on it. That's me. 
Pardon? It was that small. It was small. <laughs> but she had small hands. <laughs> She's Mary of Burgundy. Her father just got killed in a battle, and she was the only heir. So she inherited the province of Burgundy and most of what was the Netherlands at that time, the Low Countries at that time. And of course she becomes, and she's single, she's uh, 20 years old, and she, uh, she is the most eligible bachelorette uh, in Europe at that time. And there's a tremendous competition to marry her, especially the French are very intent on marrying her because they want burgundy. Whoever marries Mary gets the Low Countries. Well, it's uh, Maximilian who wins out. He's the uh, uh, Archduke and uh, or Prince, actually Prince of uh, the Habsburg family at that time. And uh, he eventually becomes uh, Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. So the provinces of the Netherlands goes into the House of Habsburg. And if you know anything about the House of Habsburg, they have a global empire at this time. They have uh, South America, they have Indonesia, they have uh, interests around the globe. And suddenly the Netherlands is a part of all of that. They become an inter international, they have international in, in, interests almost overnight <coughs> uh, uh, because of this wedding. What's the date of that? Uh, 1477, mm -hmm. August 19th, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't know why I remember that. <laughs> um, This is what Europe looked like at that time. The Holy Roman Empire. And you see that uh, those crosses, that's the Spanish branch of the Habsburg family has Spain. They don't have Portugal yet, but they also have the Low Countries now. And the uh, German branch of the Habsburg family has that strip right where you see Vienna. And you notice the Ottoman Empire. Uh, this, is, uh, this is what everybody in Europe was concerned about at this time. They were intent on taking uh, Vienna. In fact, in, in 1529, they almost did. Except for incessant rain, they put a damper on <laughs> on their invasion and on their supply lines and so forth. Suleiman had, had notified uh, Ferdinand, uh, who was the Archduke in control of uh, Vienna at that time, that I plan on having breakfast in your palace in a couple of days. Well, after a couple of months, they eventually had to withdraw and Ferdinand wrote uh, Suleiman, your breakfast is getting cold. <laughs> At least we know they had a sense of humor back then. Uh, that's an actual quote. Exactly. <laughs> Weren't there British royalty wanting to marry into the Habsburgs? Yes. Uh, Henry VIII was uh, always uh, uh, in the background trying to maneuver people into that relationship so that they could get control of uh, uh, certain territory. So the Netherlands is part of the Habsburg Empire. Uh, they find, uh, they become acquainted with overseas routes, uh, stuff that com is coming out of the Far East the spice trade and gold and silver coming out of uh, South America. They become part of this for about a hundred years. 
But as with most things, it doesn't last. Uh, the Reformation breaks out. Uh, the Calvinists, Calvinist Protestants start uh, taking uh, over large areas of uh, the Low Countries. And uh, the response of the Spanish uh, Habsburgs is to uh, uh, put down or to force them to relent. More people are hanged in the Low Countries than any other place mm -hmm. because of their refusal to uh, relent. And uh, it becomes a very nasty situation. And the other thing is uh, the Spanish also raise taxes and uh, to support their armies that are confronting Spain or confronting France and the Ottoman Empire. These two things, political and religious, pushes the Dutch to uh, revolt against the uh, Habsburgs. It goes on for 80 years. When they had a war, it, it lasted a long period of time, simply because there were certain seasons when you actually fought and you didn't fight in the winter or in the dark or whatever. Uh, so it, uh, it did uh, last until 1648. During this time, the Dutch have to survive. They no longer can depend upon that part of the Habsburg Empire that's bringing all kinds of goods in. They had become the sort of the warehouse of the Habsburgs. Uh, stuff would be brought in, would be brought in from around, around the globe, warehoused or finished off in the Netherlands, and then transported into the Baltic trade. England and then into the Mediterranean. So this all was lost when the Dutch revolt. This gives you an idea of what they were able to establish. These are Dutch trade routes after the uh, revolt. They especially uh, took over areas that belonged to Portugal at the time. Portugal wasn't quite as strong as, as the Spanish Habsburgs, and they were able to take, o take over a lot of the islands in Indonesia at the time and develop their own uh, spice trade. An English historian by the name of uh, Jonathan Israel he wrote a book called uh, The Dutch Republic. It's about a thousand pages. <laughs> Everything you ever wanted to know uh, about the uh, Dutch history. But he is very interested in uh, complimentary about the Dutch and their ability to put together a trade route, trade routes around the world. When you think of it, the, the Dutch only had a million and a half people at that time. France, England, uh, the Holy Roman Empire, they were eight, nine, ten times the size uh, of the Netherlands. They had more resources than the Netherlands, or the Low Countries, I should say. <laughs> the only resource that the Dutch had was water. That was the only thing they could depend on. They had three river systems running into their, uh, or emptying into the Atlantic uh, by the North Sea. And uh, that, was, uh, that was all that they could depend on. He says, except for Britain after 1780, no one power in history ever achieved so great a preponderance over the processes of world trade as did the Dutch in the 17th century. So that's who we're dealing with. We're, we're not dealing with uh, people on wooden shoes and uh, making uh, chocolate or whatever. And, uh, uh, th this is a serious group of people and they have put together a global empire. 
it, uh, it was probably the first empire uh, beyond the Habsburgs upon which the sun never set. The English uh, are obsessed to take over what the uh, Dutch had. And uh, they're so preoccupied with some of their own uh, civil wars and so forth that uh, the Dutch are able to uh, put this uh, commercial empire together. They build a ship that becomes the carrying trade ship of the world at that time. It's called the Flag. The Flag is. Uh, has a very simple uh, rigging system. They're able to reduce the size of a crew by th uh, 33%, which saves any merchant a lot of money. And so these ships become the carrying trade around the world at that time. The Dutch were not just sending stuff from, let's say, Indonesia back to the Netherlands. They were using their ships to trade, let's say, from Japan to China, China to India, Persia to Sri Lanka or Ceylon. Uh, they had this international uh, trade in the Far East that was bringing them a lot of money. And they had the Bank of Amsterdam that was formed in 1609. It was the most trusted financial system at that time. And you could trade like this and your money would be guaranteed if it was done through the Bank of Amsterdam. In 1609, there was a truce right in the middle of the 80 years war and Hudson who's looking for a trade room He's looking for a trade route to the north. This is, uh, this is a very interesting story. There have been many attempts to come around this way. Today you can do it. <laughs> the Dutch, the English, Especially the Dutch and the English have tried many times. Uh, in uh, 1590, 1596, Willem Berensen and another ship, they made it this far. This is uh, Novaya Zembla, which means new land in, uh, in Russian. The ship got marooned here. Oh. The ice started pushing in under the ship and it went up like on a pedestal. And they had to climb out of the ship in order to uh, survive the winter. This was like in uh, late August, early September. And they had to build a house on the Via Zembla to survive the winter. They were being attacked by polar bears. And uh, there was an artist aboard the ship, Lord Barron's uh, ship, and he made drawings of all of this. They didn't have a camera, of course, but the next best thing is to do good detailed drawings, and he was very good. If you look in my newsletter, the, uh, the new, uh, the, <laughs> I can't even remember the name of my own newsletter. <laughs> uh, the New Netherlands are not curious. We don't do that one anymore. Uh, but uh, you can find it online. I've got all of his uh, uh, drawings uh, published. They managed to get out the following June and get down into Russia and make it back to uh, the Netherlands. Uh, Barons dies along the way. And, uh, but they named the sea after him, the Barons Sea. Hudson never does find a route to the, to the 
far east. He gets about this far off the coast of Norway, runs into very heavy seas, and the crew is on the verge of uh, mutiny. This is Hudson in the Halvaman, the, the half moon. And uh, Hudson says, uh, well, I'm supposed to go back to Amsterdam. In his contract, it says, if you can't make your way further east, come back here. Do not go any other way. <laughs> Which he ignored completely and ended up here. <laughs> and uh, so it was, was by accident that New Neville actually fell into Dutch hands. Much to the uh, dismay of the English, who are sitting out here on the shelf of New England, and down here, I'll show you in a minute what the problem is. Here are the here's the way to the west. Is down the St. Lawrence or up the Hudson and out the Mohawk to the Great Lakes. The Cumberland Gap isn't discovered, uh, Dan Boone actually, in, uh, until 1751. So it's the French and the Dutch who have control of the beaver trade. Mm. They uh, they form a, a colony. It's actually a province. It becomes a province of uh, the Dutch of the uh, Republic of the Dutch Republic. It's not a colony. It has uh, provincial status, but you see they have control of three river systems. This, the Delaware, is very important because it protects this conduit or this corridor to the west. Uh, the English fairly soon take over the Fresh River. This is the North River, the South River, and the Fresh River. They didn't name it the Hudson River until much later. <laughs> I've heard the tugboat men still call it the North River. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. They still call it North Creek up in the Adirondacks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, with all of this happening, uh, the Dutch bring over uh, all of their style of living, architectural styles. Hmm. Uh, and uh, way of, uh, of uh, agriculture and uh, they pretty much take control of things for a good portion of the 17th century. The artifacts below ground are still being dug up. Um, if you put a shovel in the ground anywhere in Albany, you're going to hit the Dutch village. It's down there. It's still there. They uh, will tell you that no, it couldn't possibly be because there was a hotel on this site and you couldn't find anything if you went down any further. This is what they were saying with the key corpse site. Exactly that. And uh, sure enough, you went down just a little bit in fact, somebody on a Sunday afternoon dug down a little bit and found uh, the second almshouse. And uh, it, uh, it disturbs local developers because they, they have to stop working or they have to argue uh, to uh, uh, keep uh, on schedule. <clears throat> So all of these artifacts that were eventually dug up, especially in that corner of Fort Orange in, in the uh, 1970s, they all belong to the New York State Museum now. 
and so they're uh, on display. If you go to the museum, there's a uh, in the west uh, in the west side. There's a uh, exhibit on Port Orange and a lot of the artifacts that were dug up. Uh, the uh, Krylo Museum across the river also has a lot of uh, a lot of the a lot of the best stuff. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I encourage you to go there as well. But that's underground. What about above ground? That's what we're here today for. And uh, you have uh, archaeological uh, detritus, and you also have linguistic detritus. <laughs> and uh, what I've been dealing with uh, for many years is trying to uh, find uh, the uh, words and phrases that have survived, like Winklehawk. Uh, besides the place names and besides the family names. How many of you knew uh, Dick King? It's got to be somebody. I, knew, I know Mark King is here. He's not going to admit it. <laughs> I ran into, in fact, I ran into him at, I think, your engagement party. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He was sitting right next to me. He wanted to know what I did. He says, Oh, my great grandmother uh, spoke Dutch. And so uh, he started giving me these phrases and so forth. And after that, whenever I saw him, it was usually in a grocery store in Canterbury. He would track me down in one of the aisles. <laughs> yeah, you know, I said, I've got some new words for you. <laughs> but of course, I never had anything to write it down with. <laughs> and when I did have something, and he, he wasn't there. <laughs> but uh, he had some interesting uh, phrases, uh, uh, some uh, x rated. <laughs> What other words are there? Uh, you're, fa you're familiar, of course, with uh, cookie, uh, stoop, uh, boss, comes from Dutch bass, and a, ah, a long a ah in uh, New York Dutch becomes an all. Very uniform. How many of you uh, know what a dauber is? How many of you go fishing? Do you do you use the term? I I've heard it. You've heard it, yeah. I went fishing once in my life <laughs> with my uh, cousin, and I was just going to throw the hook in. He says, "No, you got to put a dauber on the line, otherwise it will just go to the box." <laughs> and it's a float, but we called it a, a dauber, and that's a Dutch word. I caught a fish right away and I couldn't help. I was very squeamish about animals. Hurt an animal, <laughs> even a fish, it turned out. <laughs> and uh, I never went again. Uh, that's another story. Uh, hooky. To play hooky. A hook is a corner, to go around the corner, to hide around the corner is to play hooky. Or you uh, don't go to school, but you're uh, you're out, you're someplace else. How many of you have uh, eaten a peach? And what's that thing in the middle of a peach? By the the pit. A stone is English, and in, in American English, it's a it's a pit. Peach pit. It's directly from uh, from the Dutch. And of course, we've all had coleslaw, which is coleslaw. There's that ah becoming an ah again, coleslaw, which simply means cabbage salad. Does anybody have any other word, any Dutch words, or some something odd that you might want to know? Somewhere they mentioned the word kill, and I wondered if the English word had come from that. Or... I'm 
going to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> How about flowers? Par de bloom? What? Par de bloom and fleur de lis. The flowers, Queenie, yeah. Anne's, yeah. Queenie Anne's lace, and I can't remember if the other one's dandelion. Yeah, dandelion, the, isn't it? Yeah, there's a corn flower too. Yeah, I think uh, that uh, probably is uh, from the Dutch. That blue flower you see along the road. Mm -hmm. And chicories. So like oh, liver, chicory. What's that? Chicory, chicory, chicory. 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 Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, kill is one of the reasons we're here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I uh, I had visitors from the, the Netherlands, uh, oh, this was years ago, and they had driven up from the city on the throughway, and they passed that sign, Norman's Kill. Mm -hmm. And that's the first thing they asked me was, uh, some Normans get killed here? <laughs> what's, what's the story behind that? And uh, I said, well, a, a kill is, a, is an estuary. And I, and I figured they were probably thrown off because it had two L's on it, which means nothing. It's a closed syllable and the an I would be a short vowel anyway with it double I or one I. In, in Dutch, it's K-I-L. And uh, I told them that it's a Dutch word. And they looked at me again as if I didn't know what I was talking about. I said, have you been to uh, uh, Zela? Yes. Have you been to uh, Slavskill? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a kill. Have you been to Dordrecht? Have you been to Dord Dortzakil. There are two place names surviving in the Netherlands with kill. Mm -hmm. For some reason, the Dutch who came over here adopted that and, and adapted it to any kind of waterway. Mm -hmm. And uh, it doesn't matter whether it's an estuary <laughs> or whether it's a creek. There's a uh, there's a stream near Alplas, uh, outside of Schenectady, mm -hmm. called Panaku Kelicha. Yeah. Panaku Kelicha, mm -hmm. a pancake little stream. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, there are killages all over the place. But the Dutch would never use that because an estuary is big. I mean, an estuary means it's, uh, it's tidally uh, activated. It flows both ways, uh, like the like the Hudson River. It's a, a four foot uh, uh, increase uh, in the Albany area in the, in water in the level of water. I've counted on county maps uh, for New York mostly for the Mohawk and, and uh, Hudson Valley, 110 kills. Now that's just on present day county maps. If you look at maps in the 19th century and 17th century, you're going to find more uh, because they simply, either those uh, kills haven't been represented or they've dried up or they've been paved over or whatever but you're going to find probably three times as many uh, kills. It's something that we have only here. The South Africans, the Afrikaners, did not use kill. Uh, they used kreek, kreek, and bak, and dake, uh, but not uh, kill. Why? I have no idea. <laughs> that's that's the most difficult uh, question in linguistics: is why? <laughs> why did that happen? Why why the first sound shift, the Germanic sound shift? And uh, people have been debating that for uh, centuries. And, uh, there's usually no no answer or no response. The other word was a fly. Fly is fly, 
Belai. It's not fly, but belai. Belai. It has, uh, there is voicing in the, uh, in the B, but in English, the will spell it as an F. Again, I was out near Cooperstown once, and uh, uh, there's a little community there called Fly Creek. And I asked an old timer, probably in the bar or whatever, <laughs> question, uh, why Fly Creek? He said, oh yeah, there used to be a lot of flies. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike other places. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's usually the case with uh, etymologies, uh, especially if it's somebody from the area and they don't know, they don't know why that, that name uh, is given. They're so embarrassed not to know that they'll make something out of it, not And uh, that's uh, very common. Yes. Are the bees in Dutch pronounced with a F like they are in German? Or? The V, it, it has a slight voicing. It's the, 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 It's not F, but it's V. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's very subtle, but, uh, but it is very close, very close to the German uh, uh, V. Is uh, Bly, the B L Y Creek on the border of uh, New Scotland and, and Yolan? Uh, yeah, like it goes through Boris, yeah, Bly yeah. Creek. Yeah. 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 yeah, that would have been originally Fly Hill. Oh, Fly Hill. Yeah, and, and what does it mean originally? What did it mean? Yeah. A, a, a swamp or a uh, like a valley? Well, it's a lowland, yeah. which would be a valley. Anything, anything, a marsh, a marsh or a swamp uh, where you've got salt uh, 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 hay out of. Uh, they used to feed uh, cattle. <laughs> Oh, the other uh, the other name I didn't mention that we have uh, adopted from Dutch is caboose, <laughs> which you don't have on trains anymore. <laughs> it's a combas, and in Afrikaans it is the word for kitchen. <laughs> so they've taken it as a, uh, uh, a meaning railroad meaning and adopted it for uh, place in the house. Compass. Caboose. What other uh, names do we have? The ones that the ones that are most familiar to us is what we can see or can see every day. And one of them is the Helderbergs. Uh, now why the Helderbergs? Heller, Heller What? Heller, Heller, originally Heller, Bright Mountain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, the clear mountain. The, the Helder, uh, it's a comparative, when you have a comparative of hell in Dutch, you don't say Helder, Helder, you say Helder. You put a, a D in. So it means the clear mountains. And I have, uh, Created a artistic masterpiece. <laughs> Can you see this? This is the North River. This is North going this way. A lot of maps were actually oriented that way in the 17th century. Instead of up and down, they were this way. This is Fort uh, Orange. This is the Escarpment, and this is the Catskills. Now, my office in the Cultural Education Center looks right out at this. I see the, uh, on clear days, I see the Catskills. On unclear days, I can see the Escarpment, but not the Catskills. 
So I'm convinced that when somebody was on the port, on the bastion of the port, some days they could see the Catskills and other days not. And this also goes for this configuration. This is Broadway, this is Broadway, and this is the River Road, and this is State Street. Now there was a term, I probably shouldn't write this down. <laughs> There was a name for Albany. This is under the English now. They uh, they kept the old word for Albany or for Beaver Bank, which was bank, bank, which means a hoop net in Dutch. And the hoop net. It was usually tied here. Then you had another little net going in with the hole. Fish would go in and couldn't get back out again. So it's it's this type of configuration we're talking about. The Dutch use this term all over the world for anything that has a narrow opening that goes into something broad, something wider. <laughs> if you go to Cape Cod, Right at the tip of Cape Cod, you have an entrance into that inner waterway. And the Dutch called it Paddock Bay. The, on an old uh, map, Dutch map, it's Paddock Bay. There's a place on Curacao, Sponsavater. This is the coastline of Curacao, Sponsavater. This is called Paddock this uh, entrance. So it's a small. <laughs> I've never even given this to a newspaper report. <laughs> I'm afraid that it's been misspelled. <laughs> it had trouble with it. It's, uh, it comes out in English as bank, bank, this A. In Dutch, this U I or U Y A becomes an I, like in Stuyvesant, Stuyvesant Plaza. It's not Stuyvesant, which should be Stuyvesant Plaza, it should be a diphthong. <laughs> you can tell your grandchildren about that. <laughs> Stone Arabia, how many of you have been to Stone Arabia? <laughs> Great, yeah, I, I come from just a few miles from there. In fact, my sister lived in Stone Arabia. And uh, there are all kinds of stories about the meaning of Stone Arabia. It's, it's a Dutch word, it's a Dutch place name. It appears in uh, where Lansenburg is now, and Troy used to be Stained Rock. Was originally called Stain Rapia. Uh, there are Stain Rabies or Stain Rapias in New Jersey. There's one etched on the, the cornerstone of a house, Stain Rabi. There's a Stain Rabi Road uh, in uh, Omeyan. And it means Stony turnips. <laughs> Little stony turnips. Now, now why is that? Because if you've been a farmer, <laughs> you know what you're doing every spring, is picking stone. We were right on the edge of, uh, right on the edge of the uh, uh, Mohawk River. And every spring we had to get the stone boat out and uh, hooked it with a chain to the tractor and go through this, especially this one field. Uh, I was hoping that uh, it would get sold or developed or something. <laughs> get rid of it. But we took uh, tons of stone out of there. It just kept popping up. And usually like that. Yeah. Si size of a baby's head, maybe. And... Uh, <laughs> 
and this is a, a term the Dutch hadn't encountered this in the Netherlands. They had a great alluvial soil there. Uh, you didn't have to pick stone like you did here. Uh, stone was all ground up as the glacier uh, retreated to the north, uh, and so there must be uh, a mile deep on, on either side of the uh, Mohawk River. We all know Beaver Bank. Uh, Catskill. Catskill isn't named after a cat. Uh, I noticed uh, a couple of years ago they put cats' heads on the, the parking meters. They had like a, a, a cover here imitated a, a cat. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. I think that but yes. kill the mountains as opposed to the tree. The kill. Yeah, the kill. Yeah, well, the cat, uh, the cut refers to the sachem, the Indian chief who was uh, in charge in, in that area at the time. And it was very early. It was like in the 1620s. Uh, his name is mentioned, uh, uh, Cut. And that name uh, survives in uh, various place names in that area. It's with a K, right? Well, it, it doesn't matter. So, <laughs> uh, a C and a K were interchangeable. Uh, and uh, for some reason, the Dutch uh, preferred the C. <laughs> I, I've transcribed thousands of documents, and I swear there aren't many capital Ks. And, uh, they'll usually put a C in it. Uh, for some reason. Again, I don't know why. Uh, Teaneck. We'll go, we'll go a little bit further south. Teaneck, New Jersey. Uh, it's the Teaneck of the Hackensack River. So there must be nine other streams flowing into the Hackensack River, but there was right where that comes in, it forms a neck with the Hackensack River. And that village was called Tinda Neck. Tinda Neck. Uh, Tenafly is another Dutch uh, name. Tenfly. Again, fly. At the swamp or at the uh, uh, lowlands or at the Muras. Uh, Arthur Kill. Arthur is uh, Achter in Dutch. Achter, yes. behind, behind the kill. In other words, it's the kill that goes behind Staten Island, mm -hmm. between Staten Island and New Jersey. Kinderhook. This is, uh, Kinderhook is interesting. You have uh, you have navigational maps. Here's the North River, and you have on the maps certain points. This is how they knew where they were when they were coming north on the river or going south. This could be a Kinderhook. And uh, I think this is an open hook. But in between, you have a rock. This is a hook. I'll spell it the Dutch, 17th century Dutch way. A hook and a rock. This is the distance between those two points. Some of the islands in the river uh, served as points and rocks. You would be at a certain island, and then you, you would know where it was in reference to the other points on the, on the uh, navigational chart. But all down the river, you have points and uh, you have hooks and rocks. Clograth 
It was on a map in the 1840s, and it shows the it shows the bank. With a like a clay bank that's been scalloped, and it looks like a clover leaf, and that's where the name for Clamorac came from. So that would be perfect for a navigator to look um, look off to the right, and there's a four leaf or three leaf clover, and you know right where you are. Uh, Kinder Kinderhook was a bit of a problem. Uh, people. Uh, have tried to explain it well when they first came up here. They saw children waving to them. <laughs> <laughs> like, they're not always going to appear when they see children <laughs> coming up the river. So, you know, and only that one bunch of kids in that one spot. I said, what they probably saw were stones that looked in the distance, looked like kids standing on the bank. And uh, that was accepted by the uh, mariners at that time for their uh, navigation. All right. What about wine and skill? Vinant, I think, is a family name. Vinant, but I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> I uh, I know where it is, <laughs> but um, it, uh, I don't think it has a, a good uh, etymology. How about Munchakil? Munchakil? A oh, Muncha? Is that Muncha? Muncha kill? Is, is, that is that like a shot glass? A shot, a shot of uh, alcohol, right? Yeah, and that's near Mordenars. Mordenars kill. <laughs> Mordenars kill. Uh, yeah. I'll check on Vinland's kill. It's a, it's a typical Dutch name. It is a typical Dutch name. What's that? It is a typical Dutch family name. It is a typical Dutch family name. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Is the name Wyatt or Wygant? Or Wynans. Wynans. Yeah. W W I J. Yeah, I was just wondering how it's in touch with Gant. I got anxiety. W I J N A N T. Wynans. An I J is an A. An A. In the, the I J stands for two I's. There was a sound change in the late Middle Ages from an E. To form an E, you would simply write the E twice, and that would be E. And it slowly became A, 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 A. It was a, it was a scribal convention not to write two I's because it could be mistaken as a U or an N if you didn't have the dots in the right places. So they would extend the second I in, to look like a J. So that's where that IJ comes from in Dutch. It's simply uh, a diphthongization of a long vowel. Now, uh, what's that? Gainsport. 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 Gainsport is a, a goose. And the fort would be like the ford. Like Frankfurt. I can't hear you. Water Water Fleet. Fleet. Oh, Water Fleet. Uh, that was a uh, that's a place name in uh, the Netherlands. It, it appears in South Africa as well, Water Fleet. And it's interesting that we pronounce it the way they pronounced it in the 17th century. <laughs> With an epithetic vowel, water fleet. fleet. We don't say water fleet, we say water fleet. fleet. And uh, that's uh, a true 17th century uh, convention. It allows you to move from one sound to another without injury to your vocal cavity. That's fleet, water fleet. If somebody says, well, a water. 
a bleed to you, you know they're not from here. <laughs> yeah. Yep, there's a there's a village in the Netherlands called Beervliet. 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 Yeah. He's an in, you know who he was. No, uh, I have no idea. The guy from Beervliet. <laughs> He's the guy who started the herring industry. Right, that's what it's famous. That's what yeah. they do there. He's the, uh, and it was a secret for a long period of time. This is in the Middle Ages. They have a statue to him in the village, to this uh, guy. Uh, well, I've they, never been there. My great, great somebodies were born there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's the one who said you have to gut the fish at sea and put them in a brine solution, a salt solution. And you have to keep one element of the internal organs intact because that'll preserve the fish the longest. You know, it was a chemical reaction. And he's the one who, uh, barefoot, he's the one who, uh, yeah, I wasn't going to bring that up. <laughs> he, uh, he got a commendation from the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. And they went to the village and uh, honored him and they erected a statue. Hmm. Because the herring industry was the industry in the Netherlands at that time. Hmm. It still is a big industry. They still produce a lot of herring. Hmm. But um, flow, just the water flow. Oh, uh, no, nothing to do with a fleet of boats. No, no, we're not a fleet of ships or anything. No, it's just it's just a, a, a flow, a water flow. Sure. Uh, <coughs> I've got a, this will be the final thing. I'm glad I put it up. I won't have to write this whole thing out. You see this name? Talking about family names and so forth. This guy, Jan Hendricks, appeared in court many times. I'm not going to go through all of his problems, but... Uh, uh, he was brought to justice, and uh, he appeared with various parts of his anatomy and his uh, profession and his origin, and it was driving the, the English crazy because they couldn't figure out who he was, <laughs> because every time he appeared in court, he would have a different uh, name <laughs> uh, with uh, Jan Hendrik. Sometimes it would be Jan Rothar. Rothar is again red hair. Uh, von Salzbergen. Uh, Salzberg is a German community near the uh, Dutch border. And Timmerman, he was a carpenter. So Jan was the name of his paternal grandfather, most likely. You know how they had the uh, <coughs> the naming system. Your first son was named after your paternal grandfather. Your first daughter after the maternal grandmother. Then the second son would be named after the maternal grandfather and so forth. So you had this inner weaving of, of names. So we know that his father was uh, his grandfather was Jan, and his father was Hendrik. So you have Jan Hendrickson. SC is, ju is just a z sound. You know the term uh, uh, Vidalice, V I Z, yeah. meaning with respect to yeah. or namely, V I Z. You don't have to put a dot after it because the Z stands for that. People insist on putting a dot there. <laughs> and they tell you don't put a dot because people stop reading when they see that dot and I stumble over it. I said it doesn't need a dot. And uh, uh, so we know that uh, Jan Hendrickson had red hair, was from Germany, and was a carpenter. In, uh, in 16, uh, 1687, the English required everybody to adopt a surname, a family name that would be passed on to the children so that they would avoid this type of uh, problem. There's another name uh, I neglected to look it up. 
but uh, there are like five kids involved, and each one of them sort of adopts a different name. Mm -hmm. This is that brick wall that genealogists mm -hmm. run into <laughs> when they get to the Dutch of the Hudson Valley or Mohawk Valley. Is, uh, you need confirmation then from other sources, and it's, it's a major problem. I've, uh, if you're interested in more words in the American language, Dutch words, uh, this is a friend of mine, uh, Nicolina van der Sey, uh, just came out. She didn't have Winklehawk in her book. <laughs> so she put it in. Uh, but she's got uh, a lot of uh, words that you would not expect to be uh, Dutch. Uh, uh, in, in this uh, book, and each one has a little history with it, and uh, it's very nice to look at. I highly recommend it. And Bailey is a classic on the Dutch uh, uh, family naming system in uh, New York and New Jersey. And uh, I think of uh, oh, one more thing. <laughs> Greenbush. Ah. Greenbush. Yeah. It's Grenovos. Grenovos. Pine bush. Pine woods. Grena is a, is a Dutch pine. Not the color green. When the English saw Grenovos written, because the Dutch would sometimes write with two E's, even though it was an open syllable and so forth. And they would think it was green. Green Island is a uh, Gena Island and is Pine Island. The only one place they got it right was uh, Pine Hills. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yes, does the bush mean anything in it's Dutch? A bus. A bush is a bus, a woods. That's all. Oh, oh. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Did you ever hear the word Sellerlauk? Yes. That's a Dick King word. <laughs> That's one of the words he uh, told in the Lab. You know the uh, those shutters on Dutch windows, those big heavy shutters that you can lock in place? Uh, he said they used to use those shutters uh, for an outdoor cellar. And they would, they called it a cellar lag. That shot is called a lag. And uh, yeah, that's one of, yeah, that's interesting. Did you know Dick King? No, I didn't, but my grandmother knew that word. Yeah. And my other grandmother came recently from Holland. Yeah. And so she knew both of those words were Dutch. My, it was just in common language in our family. But yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. Uh, I, I had somebody here. Have you come across the term cripple bush? Yes. Which, I assume it's, it's a thicket. Thicket or swamp. Yeah, it's a, it's a thicket that uh, uh, wood, uh, a uh, undergrowth or growth of wood. And after you clear cut and you start getting all of that scrabbly wood intertwined and so forth, uh, it's the type of wood uh, that built uh, uh, trying. Uh, the wild boar like to run through. Now, and uh, yeah, it's a uh, cripple bush is common. So, I currently I work for the ACHA <coughs> and working on digitizing of the Allen family register. Uh -huh. Cripple bush appears commonly. The term that I've yeah. recently come across is Lubert on cripple bush, which I don't understand. Well, this one Lubert, L U B B E R T. That being said, the person who wrote it was not fluent in Dutch. So they may have spelled it incorrectly. I don't know. <coughs> writing. I'm writing. Send it, send it to me. And, uh, uh, I'll, uh, I'll see what I can call it. What, what portion of the, the Hudson province uh, that was created? It's sort of shaped like the continent of Africa um, was was part of what what portion of that province was uh, Rensselaer Rensselaer 
What? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What portion of that is is Rensselaer Vic and and uh, Rensselaer? Uh, uh, Rensselaer's bank is basically Albany and Rensselaer County, and a little bit of uh, and some of Columbia County. And how is that? Now, I understand that all of that was given to. Uh, it's a patrol ship. Stephen Stephen Van Rensselaer. And it was a, it was a way to the Dutch to bring colonists over here. And and if he didn't get all of it, uh, who who were the uh, who were the Stephen Van Rensselaer for the portion that weren't weren't part of Rensselaer? Yeah, it's uh, it was all passed on to their heirs, and eventually it was uh, bought out. I think at, it lasted until after the Civil War. It was it was being uh, handed down to the heirs. The heirs were the Netherlands at that time. And, but, uh, it was all the way and, up. and, and the, the patrol ships were continuing to well after the Civil War. After uh, I mean after the Revolutionary War. Uh, then, when we were in the nation, and yet these patrol ships were only one, just all, all of the rest that had been proposed for patrol ships had all been bought out by the West India Company or by the Dutch. <coughs> because they, the, the people who had to invest in were mostly directors of the West India Company, very wealthy individuals, they couldn't come up with the money. They had to send them. So many people over in such a period of time and set them up with the farm, uh, the house, the farm, uh, Hoiberg, and his uh, haystack, the covers, uh, Hoiberg. And uh, it was a very expensive operation. Uh, there was somebody else? Yes. Your boy. Your book. Yeah. Is that a Dutch? Fir yeah. yeah, yeah. Fir woods. Fir woods. Fir woods. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Fir bushes. Uh, yeah. I should have mentioned that. That's, uh, that's uh, very obvious in this area. <laughs> uh, anything else? Yeah. Did the English uh, respect the patroon structure, or did they take that apart and? and to control the land uh, themselves. They mainly turned it into a manor, uh, a, uh, and like politics with it, and allowed uh, people to settle or uh, friends to um, make money off of it. And, uh, it's a it's a sordid business once the English take over. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing against the English. <laughs> Uh, thank you. You've been a well, and I was going to say you've been a good. Uh, I don't always say that. Are there any blessings here? <laughs> oh, oh, the blessings.